Hello and welcome to uh, today's webinar. This is part two of the series about topics related to green chemistry and green engineering. I selected a few recent papers relating to the use of RC1 calorimetry and uh, media infrared spectroscopy with React IR. Papers that show how these tools helped improve process or bioprocess efficiency. Now, if you look at these screenshots of the 12 green chemistry principles, these two are uh, directly linked to the use of instruments like React IR, FBRM, and PVM for in situ real time process monit monitoring, as well as to the use of reaction calorimetry. Um, using the RC1, for instance, to make sure a process is safe enough before taking it to a larger scale. This was the topic of part one of the same webinar series. You can watch on demand by going to our website uh, www.mt.com. Uh, the topics I'd like to talk about in part two today, uh, continuous processing and biocatalysis, are more hidden behind most of the other principles, like uh, prevent waste, omit derivatization steps, and all the ones I, I put an arrow in front. Alright, so I want to make one important comment before I start. Uh, th this presentation is not about showing why and how green continuous uh, processing and biocatalysis are. The link between continuous processing, biocatalysis and the principles of green chemistry was established a long time ago and come back uh, frequently in the mainstream scientific media. If you would like to know more, here are some recent references you can refer to in chemical and engineering news, for instance, and also another one in Specialty Chemicals magazine. If you would like to read those papers, uh, just send us an email and I'll be happy to send you the, the reference. Another fascinating paper was published in Organic Process Research and Development this year uh, about green chemistry. Uh, two of the chapters illustrating the topic are about continuous processing and biocatalysis. Finally, even though no connection to green chemistry was made during the webinar from uh, Stephen Lay two weeks ago, I would strongly encourage you to, wait to watch it on demand. Stephen Lay, professor of chemistry at the University of Cambridge, and two healthy students went over recent advances in continuous processing technologies using React IR equipped with a flow cell. As you can see here, we are coming to the point when not going into green technologies like, for instance, microreactors appear to be somehow uh, old fashioned. Alright, uh, these are the four case studies I picked up from the recent uh, literature. Uh, the intent here is really to give you a flavor of the issues facing all the chemists and engineers and how these problems are being solved thanks to the use of calorimetry or react IR in the area of continuous processing or in the area of bioprocessing. This example is coming from Peter Law at the Biotechnology Research Institute belonging to the National Research Council in Canada. Actually, I had a chance to give Peter a visit two weeks ago. This work was published in Industrial Biotechnology in 2006. The other paper is also on a similar topic. In this example, uh, mid-infrared reaction analysis was used to monitor the enzymatic catalyzer oxidation of cyclododecanone into lorry lactone. As you can see on the picture, uh, the chemical reaction itself is depicted in figure 2. An interesting comment made in the paper is uh, that most fermentation processes today are actually monitored by tracking metabolites more than the actual reaction species uh, themselves. So, uh, cyclododecanone formation could be followed based on its C double bond O mid infrared absorption at 17 13 wave number. Similarly, uh, the formation of lactone was monitored based on the C double bond O absorption at a 17 41 wave number. As shown on this uh, three dimensional FTIR surface viewer, 
uh, this preliminary study was about relative concentration monitoring, but in the next stage, once a quantitative calibration model had been established using the software QuantIR, then it became possible to monitor absolute concentration, as you can see on this lower plot diagram. Uh, this example is a testimony that medium thread uh, using React IR can be an excellent monitoring technique of reaction species for biotransformation. As described in the paper, medium thread measurements were successfully expanded to some of the ketones. Although this preliminary investigation was done via offline sampling, online use of React IR in this case is perfectly possible. Reaction kinetics determination based on actual reaction species becomes therefore possible, allowing for better control of the process from lab scale through plant scale. A further evolution would be to have an interlock between React IR and one of Metal Toledo's automated lab reactor in order to have real time and an attended control of computer generated recipe. The next example I'd like to show you covers the development of a continuous process facilitated thanks to the use of React IR. This paper is actually a follow up of a batch process development project published by Bristol MySquib in 2004 and described last month in a Metal Toledo webinar given by Paul Shaw and concerning the development of batch and continuous processes using React IR. Again, if you'd like to get more information about the development of a 6 hydroxybutyrone uh, in a batch manufacturing mode, please refer to Paul's webinar that you can get on demand or just send us an email and I'll email you the reference back. Now, going back to the development of a continuous manufacturing process to 6 hydroxybutyrone which was published in Organic Process Research and Development in 2008, it really highlights the power of real-time reaction monitoring to minimize waste. Indeed, when doing continuous, you have to consider the fact that as you are optimizing the process parameters or trying to reach a steady state, product of not good enough quality is coming out of the column. As a result, any tool that can speed up the feedback control cycle reduces the amount of waste. The process itself is about deprotonation of buspiron 1, shown on this slide, the resulting anion being subsequently oxidized and converted after quench into 6 hydroxybuspiron. Now focusing on the deprotonation itself, you can see a process flow diagram on this slide that shows starting material, solvent and base fed to a premixed column and then into the reaction column. The React IR probe is located right at the reaction column outlet and then the anion stream is fed into the oxidation column, something we are not going to describe here. So the whole trick here is to optimize the base feed rate while keeping the buspiron feed rate constant in order to optimize the anion output while maintaining side product formation at the lowest possible level. The base used is KHMTS or potassium bis trimethylsilyl amide. A sal reaction may occur from an excess of base causing the formation of the dianion, later on converting into 6 dihydroxybuspiron, the major byproduct. And, and this is how they did manage to control the formation of the byproduct 610 dihydroxybuspiron. 1. The column is first fed with pure study material. React IR shows this as a high level of buspiron relative concentration, as you can see on the, on, the, on the diagram. Then, second, the base feed rate is increased stepwise until buspiron concentration doesn't change anymore, which means that the ratio base slash buspiron is very close to perfect stoichiometry. The impact from those changes can be visualized almost instantly with real time analysis but also because inhalization is a fast process. Finally, in order to minimize the formation of 610-dihydroxybuspiron, the impurity resulting from double deprotonation of buspiron, the base feed rate is slightly reduced, something like 1-3%. This is observed 
through a slight increase of buspron concentration here at the end. As a matter of fact, this represents an optimum working point. In conclusion, the ability to monitor this continuous inlay protection during development, thanks to the use of real-time FTIR, ensures product quality through a proper tuning of ratio-based static material and feed rate. Also, real-time monitoring here helps minimize waste by minimizing startup time and allow to monitor inlay concentration, particularly the concentration stability over time during steady state. The lab reactor was run at steady state for more than 40 hours and the process subsequently implemented in the power plant for the production of almost 50 kilograms of material. Having shown two examples on the use of mid-infrared in situ reaction analysis, let's now talk about reaction monitoring using RC1 calorimetry. Actually, in this case, I'm not going to refer to one paper, but actually at least three of them. One, published in Organic Process Research and Development in 2004. One, in Chemical Engineering Technology in 2005. And also a presentation given by Dominique Roberger at the Metro Toledo Process Development Conference in 2008. The idea here is that RC1 calorimetry is one of the critical tools for assessing a process to be developed in a continuous mode. One of its benefits is to allow a quick yet accurate assessment of reaction kinetics, in addition to what the RC1 is well known for, enthalpy determination. For instance, as per Robert description, it is important to determine if a chemical reaction is very fast, therefore controlled by mixing, or if it is just rapid, which means a half-life half -life of 1 second to 10 minutes, therefore a process that's kinetically controlled, or in other words, mixing time is shorter than reaction time. If the reaction is characterized as a slow one, then process safety may be an issue on a large scale in a batch mode, as thermal accumulation is likely to be very high. So, how can RC1 calorimetry help? Well, it helps determine which category a given chemical reaction belongs to. Reaction heat will be plotted against time as the reaction progresses. When reaction heat is overlapped with dosing, a very fast reaction is going to display nice square waves in tune with dosing, as you can see on this graph. As the reaction progresses, you see heat in watts coming up from zero and going back to zero once the reaction is finished. Heat is proportional to rate, so for a given reaction, the larger the heat, the faster the reaction. If you are dealing with a very fast reaction, whatever the feed rate, the reaction rate will appear to be dosing controlled. At some point, while feeding, stoichiometry will be reached. The reaction stops and heat comes back to zero which can be easily visualized. This example was a transition metal catalyzed CW1C oxidation using sodium hypochlorite. Now, what happens in the case of a medium-fast chemical reaction? Well, as dosing rate is ramped up, you are going to start seeing the rate profile moving away from the dosing profile, which is indicative of reagent accumulation. When the reaction is run batch-wise, if accumulation is high, you may have to deal with the process safety issue, which is why this type of reaction can typically benefit from continuous mode. Batch takes you here in a sort of conundrum where you are tempted to increase temperature to decrease accumulation, but then you get side products. If temperature is lower, then the reaction is significantly slower. So continuous helps you resolve the conundrum by running hot but fast to minimize side products. Now, how about slow reactions? Well, after the addition is complete, you may get something that looks like uh, maybe a Fujiyama kind of heat profile with a slow initiation, a delayed reaction rate peak, and typically a long tail which may linger for a day or two. 
Now these are the trick you want to scale up in a batch mode. If significantly exothermic, these reactions present a process safety issue. The safety issue is made worse if the reaction is autocatalytic. In this case, the product facilitates the reaction. So as the reaction progresses, the rate gets faster and faster, as easily visualized here using reaction calorimetry. This concludes the case study about using RC1 calorimetry as an early tool for kinetics and safety assessment in general, and in particular for the development of continuous processes. The next example I want to show you is an application of RC1 calorimetry again, but this time for a kind of project for which it is not well known, yet extremely valuable. This case study published in two recent biotechnology papers describing the monitoring of P. aeruginosa activity is fascinating. The goal was to develop a better strain that would help reduce pollution coming from the tanning industry. In this case, heat measurement using RC1 shows its full benefit as it is non-invasive and does not require sampling. A standard 1 liter RC1 vessel was used equipped with a pH probe and a dissolved oxygen probe. At the beginning, the authors determined biomass growth and substrate consumption using two experiment methods, including RC1 heat and a simulation method. According to the authors, the results from th three different methods correlate well. Next, they overlapped glucose consumption, oxygen uptake, biomass growth, and heat for the same experiment. As biomass grows, so does oxygen uptake and detected heat, as you can see, the peak at the same time. As expected, glucose concentration drops quickly as a result of cell growth and metabolism. The researchers con conducted similar experiments at various starting glucose concentration and obtained consistent data every time. In the next stage, heat was plotted against biomass concentration. The slope gives heat yield, in other words, the heat evolved per gram of dry cell. Applying the same concept to glucose, they obtained the heat evolved per gram of glucose consumed. Comparing the two values allows to conclude that glucose consumption releases more specific heat than biomass growth. In other words, substrates breakdown releases more energy than biomass growth itself. Finally, plotting heat evolved versus oxygen uptake gives the oxycalorific coefficient in accordance to values previously reported in the literature. Also, heat and living cells concentration shows a nice correlation meaning that heat can be used as a painless alternative for growth rate monitoring. In conclusion, the authors showed that P. aeruginosa growth can be monitored using calorimetry, which results match well with the ones obtained with other typical technologies. Important reaction parameters like oxycalorific coefficient and heat yield values match theoretical values. All this led to a better understanding of biokinetics in this example, a future development being the design of an efficient bioreactor. Now, let me briefly wrap up this presentation and give you a broader perspective on what I just presented. Like I said, out of hundreds of publications available out there showing the use of RC1 and React IR to make processes cleaner, safer and more efficient, I picked up uh, a few of them and in the areas of chemical and biochemical transformations. As you were able to see, these tools help answer fundamental questions such as whether the reaction worked or how long it took to go to completion and whether the process can be scaled up. To, under, to, to, to be able to answer those questions, you have to get a better understanding of selectivity, reactivity, presence of intermediates or byproducts. You also need to know 
um, the reaction endpoint, how long it takes to go to completion. And you also need the tool to identify the key leverages of the key control parameters. In a second step, using RC1 technology, you can get a full-fledged heat balance assessment and determine uh, parameters like reaction enthalpy, heat capacity, worst case scenario, uh, thermal accumulation and conversion. Finally, I would like to give you a glimpse of technologies coming up that I think are going to dramatically improve our capabilities to develop green chemical processes. I have several of them in mind, but in the interest of time, let me talk about this one only. The idea here is to apply the recently published kinetic data treatment as described by Professor Donald Blackman in 2005 in the paper shown on this slide. You can use heat data from RC1 or mid-infrared data from REACT IR to conduct an early on kinetic evaluation using the reaction progress kinetic analysis. As a result, in just a few carefully selected experiments, you can get an understanding of reaction orders, catalyst stability, temperature dependence, which then leads to the determination of the Arrhenius factor. This approach really allows you to optimize the information you get from a minimum number of experiments. This productivity advantage is amplified thanks to the use of kinetic simulation that allows to predict the results of experiments not yet run. As a result, you can save experiment time, precious material, improve reaction output, and maximize your chance of a successful and safer scale-up.